Hello, this is Michael Altos, and we are here today to start talking about the endocrine system. We have two sets of lectures devoted to the endocrine system, and today we're going to start the first set focusing on diabetes, the thyroid gland, and obstetrics. So let's get started with part one. We're going to start with diabetes and talk for just a few minutes about insulin. Insulin is a peptide that is made in your pancreas. Your pancreas has beta cells which generate insulin and the purpose of insulin is to allow glucose to be transported into cells. Uh, as this happens, potassium is also transported into cells and sometimes insulin is used to temporarily decrease serum potassium levels in cases of hyperkalemia. <clears throat> In general, insulin's role is to shift your metabolism towards a storage function. So, the production of glycogen, which is a sugar storage, synthesis of lipids, which is for fat storage, and synthesis of proteins, which is anabolism, the opposite of catabolism. Insulin is metabolized in the kidneys and in the liver, and it has a very short half, half time of just about five to 10 minutes. <clears throat> However, insulin has a clinical effect of more like 30 to 60 minutes and that's because the insulin is so tightly bound to its receptors that it uh, stays there for quite some time before it's released and metabolized. Now your body makes insulin at a rate of about one unit per hour at rest but there are many things that will uh, precipitate release of more insulin most commonly food but also stress and steroids and other stimuli will cause your body to release additional insulin so that practically you're releasing not 24 but more like 40 to 50 units of insulin a day and this is in a normal healthy person. If you have alpha stimulation from certain kinds of stress that can decrease insulin production whereas beta stimulation and parasympathetic stimulation tend to increase insulin secretion. Now your insulin receptors actually get saturated at very low concentrations. So you may have seen people giving 5 or 10 or even 20 unit boluses of insulin, IV, and there isn't a lot of science to back that up. A large bolus will take longer to clear than a small bolus, so you get a little bit of a reservoir effect. But scientifically we see that running an infusion at just one or two units an hour continuously may be much more effective than giving a large bolus. Now when we treat people with insulin, the biggest risk of course is hypoglycemia, that we can drop their blood sugar too low. One of the reasons that we give insulin is not just for type 1 diabetics who are unable to generate their own insulin, but also for type 2 diabetics who have developed an insulin resistance. In these patients, they have an increased requirement for insulin in order to achieve a given effect and so the amount of insulin that their pancreas makes is no longer sufficient and so an advanced type 2 diabetic may need insulin supplementation. How do we approach insulin therapy in the perioperative period? In general we tell patients not to take any short-acting insulin, insulin on the day of surgery and that makes sense because they're NPO and if they d don't eat anything and then they take a short-acting insulin they could become hypoglycemic. As for their long-acting insulin, which they may be taking to help maintain their basal insulin secretion, we tell them they can take half of their long-acting insulin on the morning of or the night before surgery. Some patients have an implanted insulin pump, and generally I allow those patients to keep it on a continuous infusion, although for a longer case it may make more sense to just stop the pump altogether. The most important thing is that we know about the pump and we know what it's set to do so that we can take into account the insulin that the pump is delivering. But for bigger surgeries, we typically just turn them off. Now intraoperatively, we often use insulin to control hyperglycemia. And the best way to do that is really to use a protocol that involves a sliding scale. And I've shown you that protocol in your notes and we will discuss it in just a couple minutes. In a normal healthy adult, one unit of regular insulin should lower the plasma glucose by about 25 to 30 milligrams per deciliter. Now in someone who has type 2 diabetes and insulin resistance, they may see a smaller effect. And this insulin should work in about 10 minutes 
with a duration of 30 to 60 minutes, which is why we typically check blood sugars every hour. Insulin can also be given as a continuous infusion. You can calculate the infusion at 0.1 units per kilogram per hour, or you can start them at their plasma glucose divided by 150, or as you will see shortly, you can use the published protocol. Some say that insulin is absorbed into the plastic tubing and therefore they recommend that the first 20 milliliters of insulin should be flushed through the IV tubing and into the garbage. Here's an example of a sample insulin sliding scale. <clears throat> As you can see it has two phases. It has the initiation and then the ongoing titration. The initiation takes into account what the patient's current blood glucose is and it prescribes an insulin bolus, IV, as well as an insulin infusion. After that, the insulin, uh, the blood sugar is checked every hour and the sliding scale takes into account not only what the patient's current blood glucose is, but also how much it changed since the previous reading. And you can see, for example, here's a patient who has a blood sugar between 150 and 200 and if their blood glucose had dropped by less than 30 or had increased, then we'll increase their rate of insulin infusion. Whereas if they had a large drop, we'll actually drop their insulin rate by 25% in order to keep them from bottoming out. There are different kinds of insulin that can be used and pretty much in the operating room we are always using regular insulin. But there are other kinds this chart shows the different kinds, and I just want to point out that it's talking about subcutaneous administration of insulin, not IV. That's why the regular insulin has a longer onset and duration than the uh, previous slides had shown. But there's Lispro, which is an ultra-short-acting insulin. There's NPH, which is a longer-acting insulin. This is something you might take a couple times a day in order to establish some long-term insulin in your body, as well as to account for mealtimes. And the longest is insulin lantus, which actually has no peak at all, and it lasts for more than 24 hours. And this is a great way to replace um, your basal insulin, insulin secretion in someone whose pancreas is no longer up to doing the job. That's all I have to say about insulin for now, so we'll pause here for a moment in case you have any questions you want to jot down. And then we'll move on to talk about um, glucagon. So glucagon is easiest to think of as the anti-insulin. Glucagon is secreted from the pancreatic alpha cells. And glucagon is stimulated by all of the opposite things from what stimulates insulin. So hypoglycemia, certain kinds of stress and trauma, elevated cortisol levels, sepsis. All of these things cause glucagon to be secreted. And glucagon does the opposite of insulin. It mobilizes glucose out of storage, mobilizes fatty acids out of storage, brings amino acids into the systemic circulation, and it increases your hepatic production of glucose. Glucagon is not a catecholamine, but it does a lot of things that catecholamines do. For example, it increases cyclic AMP levels. As a result, glucagon will increase myocardial contractility, stroke volume, and heart rate, and this is interesting because it acts like a catecholamine and it works even in the presence of beta blockade. So this is a neat trick that has been used in patients who have beta blockade overdose. Glucagon has been used to provide some sympathetic stimulus. Glucagon also increases bile secretion and you may be asked to administer glucagon during an ERCP. Side effects of glucagon include nausea, vomiting, and hyperglycemia and so some people treat hypoglycemia with glucagon, and it has a very short elimination half-time. <clears throat> That's all we have to say about insulin and glucagon for now. Next we're going to talk about oral hypoglycemic agents. These are drugs that people typically take if they have a functioning pancreas, so we're talking about normal type 2 diabetics, Whereas a type 1 diabetic who has 
no functioning pancreas usually can only be maintained with insulin. The most common and one of the older types of oral hypoglycemic agents is the sulfonylurea drugs. These are drugs like glipizide or gliburide. These drugs increase beta cell activity, so they kind of squeeze your pancreatic beta cells to secrete more insulin. You can see why these drugs wouldn't work in a type 1 diabetic who has no beta cells, or in an advanced two, type 2 diabetic whose pancreas no longer is able to generate insulin. The most common side effect, predictably, is hypoglycemia. And as I just mentioned, many type 2 diabetics get to the point where they no longer have an adequate response to sulfonylurea drugs. The second oral hypoglycemic is metformin, also called glucophage. Metformin works by inhibiting your liver's ability to generate glucose out of lactate. As a result, we've always been taught that metformin puts people at risk for lactic acidosis, and therefore it should be held on the day of surgery. The idea being that whether it's from patients lying motionless for a long time or surgical manipulation of tissues, there may be some tissue ischemia which leads to lactic acidosis, and if metformin is blocking the conversion of lactic acid into glucose, the patients will develop lactic acidosis. There really is not much evidence to support this whole idea. And maybe with older biguanides that are no longer available, this might have been more of an issue. But really, the risk is very low for lactic acidosis. As you can see, these drugs don't affect your insulin or your glucose directly, and so there's a very low risk of developing hypoglycemia from taking metformin. The next set of drugs, these TZDs, for example, pioglitazone, which is actose, these drugs decrease your insulin resistance at the skeletal muscle and the adipose tissue, so it makes your body more sensitive to insulin. Another one, called Genuvia, is a newer drug which increases insulin release and it decreases your hepatic glucose production. And there are always new drugs coming out on the market to help manage type 2 diabetes. In general, there's always discussion about whether these drugs should be stopped in the perioperative period or not. Certainly, if a patient is going to be NPO for a long period of time, and not resume oral intake after surgery, it would be prudent to stop these drugs. But if you're not expecting any significant interruption of caloric intake, so for a shorter outpatient surgery, it's reasonable to maintain all of these drugs. So we've covered the pharmacology pertinent to diabetes, and we're going to stop here and we'll pick up in the next lecture with the next round of endocrine drugs.